Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. Yes, we're back to the original format, but it, it sure was nice yesterday to have three good martinis just three weeks away from the midterm elections, Jim. But you know, in this era of fast-moving news, um, the good news eventually has to come to an end. So we're going to have a bad and a crazy today. Uh, but i got to start with a little uh, appetizer here because as a University of Michigan football fan, you welcome all the fans you can get to a point. Apparently, former Iranian dictator Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is rocking the maize in blue. This all started, actually, when Ahmadinejad tweeted on September 3rd, the NFL season will start this week. Unfortunately, once again, at Kaepernick 7, meaning Colin Kaepernick, is not on an NFL roster, even though he is one of the best quarterbacks in the league. Hashtag Colin Kaepernick, hashtag NFL. That leads back to some guy named Fred Z. Ann Arbor uh, tweeting, Dear Mahmoud, we have much bigger problems here. Hashtag Michigan is 8-8 eight and eight in its last 16 games under Coach Jim Harbaugh with his uh, Twitter handle. Hashtag Go Blue. Also, college football is the only authentic football. Cordially, Fred. And then Mahmoud Ahmadinejad tweets back, With a hard work ethic, inshallah, the U of M will return to its glory days. Jim, I don't want Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to be a fan of my team. Uh, this is bad. I think Jim Harbaugh needs to show American Sniper again. Apparently, the message <laughs> didn't get through. But we just did see stories about University of Michigan professors being reprimanded for not writing letters of recommendation for students who wanted to study in Israel. So maybe there's actually a reason, uh, due to the ridiculously left politics of the campus in Ann Arbor, that Ahmed Denishat actually likes U of M. I knew Ann Arbor was pretty lefty. I, I didn't realize it was Tehran Arbor. Um, <laughs> The, the Probably the best way to, to recognize, I, I do like to believe, uh, Greg, that no matter how malevolent and evil a foreign leader is, there is some aspect of American culture that will eventually seduce them and kind of win them over to our side. When Kim Jong-un just loves the NBA and basketball and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> I do kind of like the idea that Amer even the most fervently, vehemently anti-American guy like Aminajad, like secretly when no one's looking on Saturday afternoons, he closes the door, locks it turns on the college football games it starts cheering <laughs> that's kind of a happy funny one otherwise it's a dark dark day for the university of michigan football program but then again maybe they're used to it it's not been the glory days for a while it's been 21 years since the last national championship um i'm hoping that mock but actually thinks that when this guy's talking about college football he's still talking about soccer but who knows uh <laughs> Yeah, not a good day for Americans who cheer for the Wolverines. But anyway, let's talk about cheering for America in more important ways. And yes, there are more important things than college football. The U.S. is number one. This is from the Wall Street Journal. The U.S. is back on top as the most competitive country in the world, regaining the number one spot for the first time since 2008 in an index produced by the World Economic Forum. America climbed one place in the rankings of 140 countries, with the top five rounded out by Singapore, Germany, Switzerland, and Japan. All five countries' scores rose from 2017, with the U.S. notching the second biggest gain after Japan's. The top spot hasn't gone to the U.S. since the financial crisis stalled output and triggered a global economic slowdown. According to the report, economic recovery is well underway with the global economy projected to grow almost 4% in 2018 and 2019. So, obviously, um, you know, markets uh, tend to ebb and flow. And uh, last week wasn't a great week on Wall Street. But overall, the fundamentals are good. You can point to, you know, the corporate tax cuts, I think, are providing a lot of incentive for businesses to grow and expand and solidify. And obviously, folks taking home a little more of their paycheck uh, is pretty nice, too. So uh, that and some deregulation, I think, deserve some credit here, Jim. You know, Greg, on top of that, you can throw the, uh, the data that came out yesterday indicating that the number of job openings in the country has hit a record 7 million. Uh, according also to the Department of Labor, we have 6 million unemployed. Greg, technically, we have a million more open jobs than people. Uh, so come on, people. Let's get out there. Start applying. Somebody somewhere is going to hire you. Um, really good news. Uh, obviously, these international rankings, you can quibble with the numbers a little bit. It's subjective. But look. America, you know, you'd, you'd like to see it as near the top as possible. And now we are back at the top. It's wonderful to see. It is kind of interesting. We, we are wa witnessing a, this is going to be really the first time since 2008, I think the economy really isn't 
uh, that much of an issue at all. I mean, people still say, you know, oh, jobs and all that. There's still wages. It's not like it's completely disappeared, um, but there's been this, you know, a, a very slow recovery. Uh, 2008 was a disaster. 2010, we were still kind of sputtering. Remember all the talk about green shoots and, you know, recovery summer and, and all that. Uh, by 2012, I think it's indisputable the economy had done well enough to get Obama reelected. Uh, people really believed that this was, okay, we're right around the turn of the corner. By 2014, I'm not so sure that was the case. Uh, also 2014, a big midterm election driven by the uh, argument over Obamacare. Obamacare was starting to go into effect. People feel a great deal of anxiety, the uh, lowering of workers' uh, hours because of Obamacare, because it made full-time employees uh, more expensive for those with more than 50 employees and things like that. By 2016, you could argue, oh, the numbers were good. But look, I don't think uh, Donald Trump wins the, the election in a country that feels great economic confidence. I, I think it's very safe to say when he was talking about economic carnage, um, that that resonated with people. And it may be that, yes, their jobs had returned, but maybe the jobs didn't have the wages they did before, um, that basically they felt more long-term anxiety about saving for retirement, maybe wondering what happens if they get sick. Uh, you know, we talk about the forgotten communities, blue collar, uh, you know, these rural communities, red state where the mill shuts down, the factory shuts down, the mine shuts down. Um, and so now I, I think I don't think you can say that the midterm elections are occurring in a bad economic time. In fact, I think you can say this is a good economic time and arguably maybe you know, your, your mileage may vary, but this probably feels to a lot of people like the best economic environment since either the dot-com boom of the late 1990s or maybe even going back to the 80s. Um, so look, this is a, if you're a Republican, if you're a conservative, this is exactly the kind of economy you want to be running for re-election in. Um, we'll see how this affects the midterms. It may very well be that people said, that people have a theory that uh, the economy is a big deal to voters when it's doing badly. When it's doing well, voters start thinking about other topics and it ends up being not, you don't get credit for a good economy so much as you get blamed for a bad economy. Uh, either way, if you're a Republican, you want the economy roaring as you head into the final weeks before the election. Early voting has already started. And for uh, for Republicans, these economic numbers are just about as good as they possibly could have hoped for. Yeah, we'll take them. And hopefully they continue for quite a while. All right, let's move to our bad martini now. And uh, it's not just bad for Heidi Heitkamp. It's just bad overall um, what she did here. Um, Heidi Heitkamp, of course, uh, ultimately voted no on the Brett Kavanaugh uh, confirmation. And as a result of that, she took some heat from her Republican opponent, Congressman Kevin Kramer, who, as he criticized her, kind of stepped in it. Now, Kramer made news when he said of the Me Too movement that the women in his family couldn't understand the movement towards victimization. He added, quote, they are pioneers of the prairie. They are tough people whose grandparents were tough and great grandparents were tough. And so the implication uh, by critics and others said, uh, well, he seems to be saying that if you're tough, then uh, you're just going to move on if you're a victim of this sort of thing. Uh, Hot Air reports that Heidi Heitkamp was upset by this and apparently decided to capitalize on it by running a full page ad in the Bismarck Times and several other papers on Sunday. The ad contains a statement about survivors of sexual abuse, and it is signed by 127 women who, in the context of the ad, are identifying themselves as survivors. But some of the women named in the ad came forward to say they never consented to have their names actually appear in the ad. From the Say Anything blog, Katie Miller of Bismarck is one of those women. She says a lot of the people listed, including me, did not give anyone permission for our names to be posted. I don't even support Heidi Heitkamp, and I am not a domestic abuse survivor. Miller didn't name any other women allegedly included in the ad without permission, but in the comments to her post, Keely Beck of Mandan, North Dakota, says her name was included without her permission as well. So the Height Camp campaign is doing a lot of damage control, finding out that several of the women's names who were provided to us did not authorize their names to be shared or were not survivors of abuse. So these women are now publicized. They might not have even been abused, and now they're trying to uh, answer questions about something that never actually happened to them. Uh, now today, CNN reporting the misstep has led some women misidentified in the ad to decry the Democratic candidate, Heitkamp, and question how their names landed on the list, with one group of women saying they are seeking a lawyer who will take our case because the ad has interfered with or downright ruined our lives. Jim? Sometimes it's better to just let your opponent step in it when you try to capitalize on it in a way that damages far more people's lives than a, a more general statement. Heidi Heitkamp's having one of the worst Octobers you can imagine. Yeah, uh, and I was just thinking about how we, we wanted to see Heidi Heitkamp defeated in this uh, midterm election. 
Uh, I don't think I wanted or anybody really wanted it to end up like this. This is an embarrassment. This is really just like watching a car accident. Uh, and it's, we'll, we'll jump to that. I'll jump to that point in a second. First of all, to Kevin Kramer, there's some version of that argument to be said about whether Me Too promotes this uh, image of women as helpless victims and whether um, we kind of get too caught up in a very simple narrative of big, mean, nasty male aggressors and, and helpless, defenseless women. If you're running for Senate, don't talk like that. If you're an older white male running for Senate, don't talk like that. Yeah, I know there's a point in there. We can have that debate. But it's just too easily to have those types of comments misconstrued uh, or taken out of context or even in context. I don't think he said it particularly well. Just don't go down that road, Kevin Kramer. It's just not going to work out very well. I think we get the gist of what he was trying to get, but it's just way too easy for that to be interpreted as blaming the victim or, or kicking the victims when they're down or something like that. Uh, just not a wise road to go down. Heitkamp sensed opportunity. Uh, ever, you know, we kind of knew that she's in, in tough shape and that she was going to have to try some you know, Hail Mary passes, so to speak, in, in these final weeks of her campaign. Uh, you just kind of left wondering how on God's green earth something like this happens. You see misspellings in campaign ads. You see talking points that go bad. You know, lots of campaigns make mistakes like this. How on God's green earth you manage to put all those names in that, that ad and not check with the women themselves is just mind-boggling. And I, again, I have a hard time. This is not the sort of mistake you can blame on low-level employees at a field office in Cincinnati, uh, to quote the, to remember the IRS <laughs> right. excuses for the Tea Party stuff. This, I, I just have a hard time believing this was some rogue employee who went off and did this, whether or not the senator ever signed off on this. Um, again, a campaign doesn't do something like this. Uh, just on a whim or on the fly or without something like that. So it's just really baffling and embarrassing. Um, I think it's just kind of time for a Viking funeral for the Hike Camp campaign. I mean, just it, it, look, we know we're going to lose. Just try to lose with some dignity. Don't go down this road. Don't start making these kinds of arguments. Um, it looks desperate. It looks flailing. I just I can't imagine how outraged not just those women must be, but all of their families, all of their friends, everybody who knows one of them, if they were a victim of abuse, dear Lord, it's that it's their decision to put it out to the world, not yours on the campaign. If they were not a victim of abuse, I can't imagine anything more mortifying than to have this. And I think one woman described friends calling her and saying, oh, my God, is this true? Are you OK? And things like that. Maybe the most deep cringe inducing mistake of any you know, campaign in recent memory. Um, and I just, you know, I'm glad Hype Camp has apologized for what it's worth. I think it was a fairly genuine apology. I don't think this was a cynical, I'm sorry you were offended. I think Heitkamp really is mortified by what her campaign did. But just an ugly, uh, just, just you know, distasteful, you just want to turn your head and not look at this race when something like this happens. That's, as far as bad martinis go, that's a really, really bad one. Yeah, it really, really is. And even though it redounds to the Republicans' benefit, probably, the fact that these women have had their lives turned upside down, the ones who are victims and having that wound reopened publicly and then the ones uh, who are thrown into that category and, and, and did not experience that. So it's just awful in so many ways. All right, let's move on to our crazy martini now and back to the Texas Senate race. Uh, right now, Ted Cruz is ahead by anywhere from seven to nine points, depending on which poll you look at. He's been ahead by eight and nine and seven. So I guess that averages out to about eight. But one of the things that Beta O'Rourke has talked about a number of times on the campaign trail is how his lifelong Republican mom has decided to vote for him in this race. First of all, that's not exactly the world's greatest accomplishment to get your mom to vote for you. Even if, even <laughs> He's if, running as a favorite son <laughs> candidate, Greg. I guess so. So anyway, he talks about how his lifelong Republican mom is now on his side, but as it turns out, and uh, good work done here by uh, BuzzFeed and, and by the CNN K-File crew, uh, that's not exactly the story. Melissa O'Rourke has largely voted in Democratic primaries in Texas since 2000. And she has donated money to candidates from both parties. She actually donated to Cruz and Mitt Romney in 2012, but she also previously donated to the presidential campaign of then-Democratic Senator Barack Obama in 2007. And that was another story I saw, Jim, where she's voted in the Democratic primary 15 of the last 17 times. I'm not sure you call that a lifelong Republican. Yeah, and I think what makes this a crazy martini is that the Beta O'Rourke 
could very well have, have you know tweaked his wording of this and made a perfectly fair argument. Even my mother, who donated for, to Ted Cruz back in 2012, is voting for me. Better line. It's accurate. As you point out, it's it's getting your mom to vote for you really should be step one. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if, if she's not, that's kind of a sign something's gone terribly wrong for your campaign. And, you know, maybe you should get get the bigger bouquet next Mother's Day. Because um, the Smothers Brothers are used to do the joke, mom always liked you first. You know, when you when you see these uh, siblings running out and recording attack ads against their, their opponents. But the 15 out of 17 just makes that a not terribly plausible argument and... The only other area you might be able to, he might be able to throw out as an extent, is the argument of, look, Texas, Texas Democrats, particularly at the state and local level, are not quite as liberal as their national counterparts, although in some places they are. I think, you know, Austin, some of the, the bigger cities. Maybe you remain a registered Democrat or maybe you vote in a Democratic primary because you have more interest in the Democratic primary. Um, but all in all, again, I think the argument of, oh, I've got, you know, one time Republicans coming over to my side doesn't pass the smell test. Uh, he's going to, you know, yes, congratulations. Beto O'Rourke is going to do better than Wendy Davis. That's not a terribly high bar to clear. He may do better than Democrats have done in the past couple of cycles. But you, know, you think about it, you, I think it was going back to 1994, the highest level any Democrat has ever gotten in a governor or senatorial race is 45%. You look at this recent polling, a whole bunch of them have Beto O'Rourke right around 45%. So it may very well be that he's topped out as a Democrat in the state of Texas. And yes, I've heard some, you know, you can make the argument that the state is getting from deep red to slightly more purplish. Uh, you know, some folks point out that uh, Donald Trump's margin over Hillary Clinton in the state was eight points. His margin over Hillary Clinton in Ohio was eight points. But all in all, I think it's a, a sense that uh, uh, Beta O'Rourke kind of tells time is running out. You keep seeing one new poll in Texas after another. And they keep putting Ted Cruz up by anywhere from four or five to eight or nine points. Um, you know, it, it, Democrats are going to be asking themselves, was this the best place to spend $38 million? Uh, my suspicion is no. <laughs> that this is, you know, they wanted to believe so badly that they fooled themselves. And, uh, you know, they'll be asking themselves whether other candidates could have used that money uh, instead of Beta O'Rourke. But uh, a little bit of road between now and Election Day, Greg. Yes, exactly. Uh, two quick things. First, a disclaimer. Uh, the race is not over just because Ted Cruz is ahead. So make sure you vote. Don't assume that it's just going to happen. Secondly, my favorite Beta O'Rourke story of the past couple of days is even though he's raised all this money, he actually has also spent most of this money. And so he says he's got nothing left to give other candidates who are a little more strapped for cash uh, in other states and other places. So uh, good job there. Good job. Yeah, let me just cross off fiscal conservatism <laughs> off the list. <laughs> Mom's not going to like that. <laughs> Maybe the mom's vote isn't locked in altogether. I don't know. I don't know what uh, what issues drive her, so we'll have to see. That's why you try to get your mom to vote early. <laughs> get the ballot in. She can't change her mind. Oh, man. That would be really awkward at Thanksgiving. Uh, Jim, have a great day. Talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And please tune in again on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.